thank you. Um, we're a software development company. Um, we develop post-production software for a company in Hollywood. Um, some of the people that use our software is Modern Family, NCIS Los Angeles. Heard the movie also used our software in the past. So today, I'm sort of going to speak about how we built our team and scaled our team instead of actually scaling our software. Because to me, if your software is architected correctly, it's quite easy to scale, um, especially horizontally. So we have developers in Belarus, Cape Town, Johannesburg, Los Angeles, and how we actually overcame some of the challenges that we had to run a 24-hour or 24-7 shop um, for, for our post-production company in Los Angeles. So we had a couple of challenges um, that we had to overcome, and that was our development environments. Because we integrate with a lot of third-party tools and a lot of Unix-based applications, we had some difficulty to get that onto all the developers' machines because we are obviously a dispersed team across the world. And we also needed to scale our team rapidly up and down. So we needed to have new hires when we had to push out a new feature. Um, we had to have, um, after a feature was closed, we sort of scaled down the team. Um, and communicating with the client, because of time zone differences, it was quite difficult. And then I'll touch a little bit on the infrastructure side of things and how we deployed this application. After I have some water. Are you guys just tired or am I boring you? <laughs> if it's boring, it's fine, we can go drink beer. So we had this tool stack that we sort of evaluated everything. And most of the software that we started using was open source because we, could, because we could actually give back to the community. And if we found a bug in the software, we could make a pull request on GitHub and actually get this solution for the problem that we were facing. Um, so this is just sort of like an overview of the tools. We use Vagrant, we use Slack. How many people use Vagrant? OK, I can stop speaking. Awesome. Um, how many people are, use Slack in the audience? Nice. Um, Strider is CICD. I love you guys. <laughs> um, OpenStack. Right. Um, and obviously SaltStack, which is a provisioning tool. So with the whole development environment thing, and because we have a lot of third-party dependencies like FFmpeg, Media Info, and so forth, we had a lot of this that applications would run perfectly fine, frame extraction on video, and that sort of thing would work, would work perfectly fine on the developer's machine because he had a later version of FFmpeg or a previous version of FFmpeg, and it wasn't the same as the version that we were running in production. So we evaluated Vagrant, and we sort of got to the point where Vagrant was the best tool for the job. So we could manage our developers' dependencies on their machines and manage um, the OSs that they ran, um, that sort of thing, through Vagrant, and that's in the GitHub repo. So onboarding a new developer would be as easy as developer clone the repo, run Vagrant up, and all the dependencies are on the machine that that developer requires to work. So from an onboarding point of view and scaling of the team at a quicker rate and getting people on board and working quicker, um, Vagrant was a no-brainer for us. How many of you guys, when you started a new company, it take two or three days to install your notebook with all the tools that you normally use? So that's one of the um, one, well, one of the biggest problems we had is that we had these dependencies that nobody actually normally used on a daily basis, and we had to overcome that by sort of supplying that to the developer when the developer started working. And because of that, we could sort of get to a point where we could do daily deployments, hourly deployments, minute by minute deployments to production because we knew the dependencies were going to be exactly the same. So we sort of don't have this. Nobody can deploy to production um, through our CI CD stack and the guy from Amazon touched on that and that everybody should actually embrace CI CD. It's saved us countless times where we deployed a feature to production and something broke, so we had to roll back to a previous version of the code. And going through git logs to see what actually broke it was quite difficult, uh, because there might have been 50 or 60 commits before the next deployment. Um, so 
we looked at Strider CI CD, which is open source software. You guys can go and clone it on GitHub now, contribute to it. You know, it's, it's, it's an awesome piece of software. It uses Docker, which I believe was a topic yesterday. Um, it's also an awesome piece of software. Um, so what we've done is we've implemented peer review. Um, we enforce testing. We enforce unit testing and integration, integration testing in our company that if somebody commits a piece of code that's not tested, it will be rejected from the pull request before it even gets into master branch. So we, once, once there's a test and the code is written properly um, and the person that's reviewing the code actually saw that and made sure that the code was correct, it, the deployment will happen because the pull request would be merged. So we had a little bit of difficulty with communicating with our clients because to us, email is not really a great, a great tool for communication, especially when people are in different time zones. It's sort of like difficult because you'll drop an email off, 10 hours later there would be an email that came back and it like sort of the trail doesn't follow nicely. So one of the applications that we use that's not open source, but there is a free version of it is Slack. And as most of you guys already know, you, you sort of use it. Um, so Slack helped us to communicate with our clients because we've got rooms for each one of our clients or each one of our projects. We invite the clients to join those rooms and they can see git commits, they can see um, deployments happening, they can see issues being created, issues being closed. So they, they sort of up to date with what's happening in their software. So we don't have to go and send an email on a Friday afternoon and say, listen, this is what we've, what, what we've achieved this week. Um, especially for time zone differences because it becomes really hairy when somebody mails you at 2 a.m. At 6 a.m. when you wake up, there's already 30 or 40 other emails, so you don't sort of answer the questions quick enough. Um, also, Slack is great for, hey, my logo is over stuff there, great. Um, also, Slack is great for the integrations that they give you. Um, we've got Sentry integrated into, into Slack, so if there's a notification that a server's gone down or if there's a code error, um, it will notify us and somebody that's awake at that point in time will get notified of it and they will jump on and actually fix the problem. So all this is great. We, we can deploy our code, we can communicate with our clients, we can scale our teams, we can onboard new people faster, but still the crux of it is how do we, as a small company with around 12 developers, actually manage servers? And we, we looked at a couple of tools like Ansible and um, we actually settled on SaltStack because one, it is, it's, it's, it's quite brilliant um, in my mind and people might disagree with me, but we sort of could deploy machines or provision machines um, quite quickly because you can incorporate this into your applications repository and run the salt script from the master and it goes and deploys on these, it goes and provisions these virtual machines with um, all the dependencies that they require like Postgres, uh, MySQL, Redis or whatever else we require. Um, and it allows you to configure those services by sort of setting up Nginx with the correct host names, configuring HTTPS, um, incorporating the SSL certificates, if for instance with some of the applications that we have that's written in Node.js, configure um, supervisor to start these things up, and so forth. Um, and all this is done on top of OpenStack. Now, OpenStack is, is similar to AWS. Um, but you can host it privately in your own cloud or you can host it in, your, in, in the public cloud. Rackspace runs OpenStack at the bottom. And the ability that we wanted from, from this is, and the reason why we chose OpenStack in our, in our environment, was because we had clients that were security conscious and they wanted their content and their annotations on video and that sort of stuff to be stored locally in their own data centers. So by choosing something like OpenStack and having the ability to deploy to a private cloud and deploy to a public cloud made this very interesting to us because we could make sure that our code runs in the public cloud and at the, uh, in the private cloud at the same time because we have dependencies and there's networking and stuff like that to configure. Um, we also use a little tool called um, Solometer which raises alerts on the VPSs that instruct OpenStack to actually start scaling up. So if a VPS is taking strain, it will go and spin up another VPS of the same, the same hardware or the same memory um, and the same 
configuration as the, pre as the one that raised the alert. And it will start automatically scaling it out horizontally. And you can do that for free if you run it in your own private cloud. Um, it also allows us for rapid deployment of new servers, um, which, which is great because we, we are in D quite a lot of stuff and we need to push stuff to production on random occasions. We'll, we'll develop a new ingest server to um, pull frames or to get frame extraction correct or that sort of thing. And we need to spin up a machine, get that in production, test it, make sure it's working because obviously we don't know enough about video um, like the studios actually do. And um, OpenStack really helped us because we could integrate with the APIs and actually spin up new machines. And we've actually got, um, which I'll tweet later, is we've got Slack integration to OpenStack to spin up VMs, which, which is quite awesome. And the benefit of OpenStack um, in our choices were because it was backed by Rackspace. Um, for most other things, um, it's quite difficult to find a partner that launches an open source piece of software that you'll know they maintain. And the biggest problem with open, open source for me, and when we went through this whole process of choosing these tools, it was very difficult to find an open source project that was still gonna be maintained in two or three years. So we either had to start in, investing time in maintaining those applications or find something that was backed by a larger company and it was used on a daily basis. So that was actually quite short, but if you guys have any questions. <laughs> There's one over here. Do you only develop on um, Linux? Or actually my question is, is Vagrant, can you use Vagrant on Windows for, for Windows development environments? Um, ba basically the whole reasoning behind Vagrant was that we had Windows machines, we had developers that came from the .NET stack that actually had to work on our Node.js based applications. And that is why we chose Vagrant. Um, because Vagrant runs on Windows, it runs on Mac, it runs on Linux. So it gives you the ability to have dependencies on a Ubuntu VM um, and code in your native tools on Windows, Mac, and Linux. It's really a great piece of software. And it uses VirtualBox, so it's also entirely free. Uh, you said you had Sentry integration into Slack, I think. Yes. Um, what, do you get it, what kind of errors do you get it to like, report back on? Um, what's been the most useful? We, we had a couple of things because um, we use MongoDB that's hosted in the cloud by Object Rocket. Um, we had quite a lot of errors where MongoDB sort of would disconnect from our stack um, because it was in a private cloud and MongoDB was sitting in the public cloud. And we've since sort of merged the two and brought MongoDB down. So we had to, we, we sort of get errors where um, database connections go down, um, Redis connections go down. General application errors. Um, if there's application errors that gets thrown because somebody has done something weird on the app, we want to be proactive and not reactive when we see when we see errors. We don't want cu customers to actually email us and say, "Listen, I could not annotate on this video, or the annotation that came out was a black frame." We wanted to know about the error before the customer actually even notified us. And obviously, our iOS applications also integrate um, through the Sentry stack. So you said you get um, your customers to interact with you via Slack. Yes. Are they happy to do that? Like, do they like resist it because they already use email, and for them, creating a new thing is kind of like. It. Um, for, for for the most part, our customers actually uh, our customers have actually embraced it. They sort of prefer doing that than having email, um, because it, because it's more you can do one to one communication, or you can shoot off a quick line to a client, or a client can shoot, shoot off a quick line to you. It's always quite a bit of a pain to open up email, let's type a long email, and you want to put as, as much information in the email um, as possible. And the, event, the, the, the loop of how long it takes for, to get a response, so you can see if somebody's typing or if somebody's going to respond. And the conversation just starts flowing a lot nicer. <laughs> 